Welcome to another episode of the Talk Freelance to Me podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Cisneros Mejia, and today you are in for a treat. I have my good friend, Lyle Smith, on the podcast. How are you, Lyle? I'm very well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. We're talking all about your new book. I have a copy, Why Yellow Matters. <laughs> I'm super excited to get into this. I've read it. I've marked some things that I really have enjoyed. I've taken some notes to. Awesome. Can't I wait to dive that. into this. Freelance <laughs> fam, as usual, I always give you a little snippet of our guest bio so you can get to know Lyle a little bit more. Lyle Smith is the author of the new book, Why Yellow Matters, and the host of the Story Forge podcast. He's been a daily newspaper reporter, editor, in house marketing executive, agency creative director, author, and for more than a decade, chief of his own consulting brand story agency called Nimble Smith where he helps small to mid-sized businesses get their stories straight so their customers recognize the depth of their value. Lyle, you have done a million and three things in the writing <laughs> world. We were just talking about that before we um, started recording. Mm -hmm. Congrats on the book, first of all. This is a big deal. Tell me the path to this book. I know this is not the first thing that you've written. I've made my career writing other people's stuff. That's been good. It's been rewarding. It's been challenging sometimes. This book came out of, it's really, it came out of a, a blog post I wrote several years ago. The title is anchored in that too. It took me a while to figure out what the title would be. We're all trying to put up content that people are going to be interested in and engaged in and, and drive some business and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I wrote this one piece. I, I, I had been scouring my house looking for one of my running shoes. And I realized it's funny because I found, I had two pairs of the exact same shoe, same model, same amount of wear, same um, age, same everything. I mean, it was exactly the same, same size. The only difference was one pair was blue and the other pair was yellow. And for whatever reason, I spent an extra 15 minutes searching around my home, looking for the other yellow shoe. Because I had decided long ago that yellow was better or mm. faster or whatever. And, and I, I sat down tying my shoe and I'm looking at my watch and saying, now oh, we don't have time to get my run in and thinking, how ridiculous is this that I spent all this extra time looking for this thing that's, that where I have something exactly the same. If I were to run blindfolded, it would be the same. And so I sat down and I wrote a little something about that. And it was a blog post length. So what, 300, 400 words, something like that. And I put it up and I got some, I got some hits on it. I got some people who were interested in it. Some friends were like, oh, this, this is, this is my one friend who I had dinner with. He was visiting here last week was talking about it. And he said, I remember when you wrote that first thing. And I said, yeah, it's, it was just something that stuck with me. And then uh, a few years later, again, I was searching to create some more content for the for the website and get some people interested. And I was I had been taking a taking a turn to writing shorter, and so I but I liked I was like this one piece. So I took the piece and I started cutting it down and trying to make it just more active and more direct and all this sort of thing. And it came out to very much what's in the book. That's really the first article in the book, and it's it's I don't even know how many words it is. But it was a writing style choice, almost poetic. Yeah, that's what form, it reminds me of. Yeah. To, if I don't want to claim to be a poet in any way, but it was just single lines and a punctuation that maybe isn't grammatically correct, but it it knocks out the pauses that I want people to think in their heads as they're reading it. And I was really pleased with it. I posted it up on LinkedIn and I got it got a ton of activity. And I was like, what's going on with this? This is really interesting. And I said, so I, I think I'd hit on something, probably the style, probably the, the, a, the, a, the idea and B, sort of the style of communication. So it's real quick and easy to read and, and punchy. And so I thought, well, I've been wanting to challenge myself to write post 30 days in a row, something, whatever it is. And so let me try and come up with a, a list of ideas that fit this format and maybe I can do something with that. So I started doing this and I did, uh, I'd got my 30 days of writing, of posting something and some of it, they weren't all articles like this. Some of them were like little photos and little ideas. And I was experimenting with a lot of different things, but I had a, enough of these things banked 
that I was like, okay, I really like this style. I like this idea. And I'm always talking about with clients, what are the, what are the things that matter to me? Because that's to me, if you're not paying attention to your audience and what they want, you have to, you have to really be tuned into what matters. Cause like, yeah, I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask people, they'll write an idea down and send any, I'll hear something. Why don't we try this? And then I'll inevitably turn back and say, yeah, it's, it's clever, but what does it mean? Mm. And so we spend an inordinate amount of time diving into what does that mean? And as a result, why does it matter? Who cares? So you write this idea down. If it doesn't connect with someone and what they need or what they want or what they're trying to achieve, what's the point? So I started figuring out these ideas and I, I got them all together. And then I, I, I collected them. Some of them were posts. Some of them never made it past my desk. And I had, I gathered the batch of what I thought were the best of them. And I ordered them into an order that seemed to make sense for me. And I looked at it and I'm like, hmm. And I sent it off to a couple of different friends. And I said, I, I, I think this is a thing. Do you think this is a thing? I'm not sure. And so I got enough yeses that was like, yeah, okay. So maybe this is a little book or something and I, I can put this together. And so I started investigating the indie publishing world from there. And that's that's where the book came from. I love it. I think it's so cool. It's definitely made me think. And it's almost to excellent. Me, yeah, it's something <laughs> philosophical, like ideas about what matters, what matters to people, about connections, about questioning these things, about the fact that people are irrational. And I know in our work, in the agency life where we're helping these small businesses, we try, we, we look at data, we look at focus groups, we look at surveys, we look at SEO. We're constantly trying to figure out what makes people tick. Right. Why do they do what they do? How can we influence them to do what we want them to do? And at one of the pieces, and I can't remember if it was why yellow matters or which one it was, which section, but it was just talking about how like people are irrational. Like even yeah. what you were talking about with the shoes. That's yeah. not rational. You you That's have not a, rational a, at all. No. <laughs> it's not. No. But but it's it's meaningful to you. It means something to you. You were talking also about like superstitions and <laughs> I love yeah. how you you talked about that being the people some people write those things off. Oh, they're just superstitions. But I love how you mentioned their rituals to people. They're yeah. how people get in the framework and the zone is what you used to yeah. do the thing that we're doing. And exactly. so I think, yeah, it's you've definitely given me a lot to think about. Yeah, <laughs> I've enjoyed well, I, it. I appreciate you saying so, but it's funny. It started out as just a bunch of things that I thought would maybe drive business or or connected to agency type people. Or I, I was saying for a while, it's for writers or people who hire writers mm. or creative people mm -hmm. and, and that kind of stuff. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought it's, it's more than that, really, I, I think. Because all this stuff matters to creative people, I think, and writers and communicators and hopefully leaders and founders and people who manage a staff of people. But it also, I, I think a lot of it just matters. A friend of mine who, who blurbed the back, my friend Jeff Simpson, said it. And I thought, oh, well, that's maybe that's what it's about. Because sometimes it takes somebody else to tell you what the book's about. Mm. And I, he said, it's really about taking the time to ask why. Mm. And I said, I like that. <laughs> it's, it really is. I hadn't been able to enunciate it, but it's. I think that's really what it is. It's because sometimes there's one about take take the time to get it right. Yes, I enjoyed that one. And I'm sure this coming from your background, and I know it from my agency background, where you so and the newspaper background in particular, so much is 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 based in deadline and getting things, yes. out, getting it out, getting it, get it out the door, get it out. It has to get out, and it has to get. Mm -hmm. Here's the and, and and I have always thought that if it's not right, it shouldn't go out the door. I think I mentioned it in the book, but in the newspaper business is where, where I learned what a deadline really is. In the newspaper business, when you miss the 11 o'clock deadline by one minute, 25 union pressmen in the next building go on overtime for time and a half for an hour. So that's what a deadline means. Now, in the agency world, if you miss a deadline by an hour or four hours or a day, most of the time, it doesn't really make that a difference. 
Right. Unless unless it's a publishing deadline, a hard deadline where something has to get printed or produced, it doesn't have that. The stakes aren't that high. So I think it's important to be aware of the stakes and it's important to, because sometimes it does matter, but most of the time, take the time, get it right. There's the famous quote from Steve Jobs who always taught, because people would tell him, you have to listen to what the customer wants and give them what they want. And he said, no, I, you tell the customer what they want. Mm. That's what this is. And it's, I'm not so strong on it that way, but it's like, it's, if you pay attention to what matters to them, you can create something that they will want and pay attention to and read and pick up just because you understand what matters to them. You're not making something, the, the, that part of tell them what they want, it only works if what you're telling them they want is something that actually works for them. It only works because the iPhone is really cool. <laughs> it doesn't If the iPhone was not that cool, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. As you were speaking, something was coming up in terms of trust. Like I was thinking about trust because when you, when you don't like in the newspaper for using, okay. if we're talking about in that context with news, mm -hmm. when you don't get it right, when you, in your pursuit of speed to be first, you right. mess up on those details, your credibility is diminished right. and people are not trusting you to get it right. They're not trusting you to give them the accurate information that they want. And similarly, in the agency world where you're, where businesses are coming to you because they have a pain point, they have a need, they need your help. Mm -hmm. And if you, by showing that you care about what matters to them and right. understanding what matters to their target audience, to their clients, they, I feel like that builds trust, that yeah, interest, no. that commitment, right? To understanding yeah. what matters to you, what's going to make an impact to you. I feel like I, that people feel like you're listening. Yeah, I think that's really sharp. It's and and to go off on that a little bit, the the idea of some clients in my mind, they hire me because I have expertise in yes. something that they think they need or they hopefully they think they need. And you so I bring my sense of vision and creativity and and perspective to what they're doing. Um sometimes clients just want help with the heavy lifting. They, How many blog posts can you, SEO posts, can you write for me every month? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. That's great. But that's only going to get you so far. And, and I, I talk about this a little bit too, the, the order takers. So you're, if, you're, if you're a real creative person, if you're in the creative world like we are, you, your value is really comes from that you think about things differently than they do. If you didn't do that, they wouldn't need you in my mind. It's it's up to us to educate them on, yeah. on what, what they can use us for. I'm like, yeah, you can use me for 16 blog posts a month if you want, and we'll do it. And you, get, you give me a list of topics, we'll put them out 400 words a piece and keywords and blah, 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 and off you go. But if you, if you lean on us a little bit and ask what, Instead of, I need this much material every month, ask, here's what I'm trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get more X amount, more traffic. We're trying to drive X number of sales through this channel. We're trying to, and then let us design a, an idea from concept to execution, how that might happen. We're going to be a lot more valuable to you than just pounding out words at a keyboard. Absolutely. Knowing that end goal, because sometimes when you're talking about like training, educating clients and helping yeah. them understand what's possible, figuring out that end goal. I mean, it's so important. Sometimes I, I can remember situations where folks would come up and saying, I need to be on X social media platform because my competitor's there, or I need sure. a billboard because my competitor has, has one and I want one too. And it's, but what's, <laughs> what's the goal, right? Because there might be other channels that we should be using to achieve those goals that marketing, communications, PR, brand journalism, our clients are not from that world. So no. we have to show them, here's the recommended path that we think is will help you get right. to that. But, that's, but again, that's, that's the why, right? That's yeah. The, we, I need to be on this, this platform. Okay, why? Right. Why, why do you think you need to <laughs> be there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's take a, take a step back. What is it you're trying to achieve? Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe that is where you need to be. 
And then if you're there, how do you need to appear when you're there? How do you, because you, you have every, take it from the, the business perspective, but I mean, every person, everybody has a story. You, you can call it a brand, you can call it a style, you can call it a, 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 a personal attitude you walk down Fifth Avenue with, whatever, and that you want people to pay attention to or emulate or whatever. So we all have this, this style, but we have to find a way to communicate it to the people who matter to us in a way that matters to them. And yes. if, you, if you go at it and say, well, my competitor's on TikTok or my, my competitor started a YouTube channel and I have to start doing videos. Okay. Yeah, maybe, but be sure why you're doing it. Otherwise you're, you're just, you're, you're creating a lot of work for yourself that may not really deliver on the value side. A hundred percent. And, and I was, I, it's, it's hard to talk to some clients that way because they're, they're really convinced. Yeah. You know? And that's why one of the things I do with, with my clients is a, a brand story exercise. And this, this gets, you talk about trust. This gets a lot of trust for me from some of these guys, because I end up sitting in a room. I try and be with four or five people, the CEO or the founder, or whoever the top dog is, probably a marketing person, probably their right hand person, whoever that is, whatever role they might be in, because we're working with smaller businesses. So it might not be your COO. It might be your COO. And then I always ask to have somebody, have somebody in there that, that, deals directly with the customer. Ideally the customer's complaints all the time. So good. <laughs> Cuz those that's that's the that's the perspective I want to have when we do this. Yeah. And we start then we start working through through the brand story and and in a real hero's journey kind of way, who's the hero, who's the villain, blah blah blah, all that stuff. But then we take a couple of hours to dig into dig beyond those basic questions. What does it mean? And we always end up having and my biggest challenge in there is always it's always with the ceo always and it's always just trying to remind <laughs> him or her yeah hers go go with you more by the way right, they, right. They, run, they run with it they like the exercise the guys the guys tend to be really rigid about about what their box is and where they need to be and which is an interesting thing i think but, and maybe a good perspective for your show, but the, the guys, they all do it because they all suffer from shiny object syndrome where they want to move on to the next thing. And they, they, they see their job as coming up with great ideas, which is, which is terrific. And that's great. And a lot of them could be really valuable from a sales perspective or a marketing perspective or whatever. But in this exercise, when you're trying to figure out your brand story, who it is you're talking to, why, what matters to them, I go through this whole thing where I, I literally have them close their eyes for a few minutes and just, okay, think about your customer, think about being your customer, mm. think about how they see you and what you do and, and, and what other people do who do what you do. Because it's, I need you to think about how you're going to get their attention and why why they should give you their attention. Because that's another thing when people read, they, there studies have been done about this. I, I remember one from the newspaper business years ago where, the, where they, they always say people don't read anymore. And it's not exactly true. They, they, they read, they will grant you their time in about five second increments. And if you're still valuable to them after five seconds, they'll give you another five seconds. And they never give you the whole article. They'll give you five seconds at a time. And so when you write, it's good to keep that in mind. That's what I found writing this stuff was the short sentences, the short ideas. It keeps you moving along in the idea. So try and write like Hemingway. People, you, you will lose them because they only grant you their time in very short bits. And once you lose them, they're gone. So same with the CEO. I have to keep reminding them, no, great idea. Love it. Make a note. But you're talking to me through your CEO eyes. I need you to think through your customer eyes. And I, I'm constantly reminding them to do that. And when I can do that, we, we come up with something pretty fantastic. So it's fun that way. I love that you include <laughs> all of those folks in those, those brand storytelling sessions. It makes me think almost of families too, because as parents, I know you have a son, I've got three kids mm -hmm. here and as parents, we have our kids, we see them, we welcome them into the world. We decide what their name is going to be, right. but then they decide who they are. And I feel like they slowly 
reveal themselves to us, who they are, right. what their ideas about the world. And we can try to influence those things, but they really become their own person. And we yeah. want them to become their own person, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, with, with a company, I feel like founders, it's hard. It's hard to get them to step away and realize that what they intended their company to be and what was in their brain first, once right. it was released into the world, and you've got all of these people that become part of the team, and the customers will come and tell you, yes, that's what I want. You were close, but this is really what I want. That that company takes on its own personality and becomes this entity separate from the genius of the founder. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like that is the friction and the resistance is getting the founder to understand that that entity that company that product that service that's it really, may look different right yeah yeah that's a fascinating metaphor and, and I, I, it made me think of two things one as a writer when you're writing because i write fiction as well and i've written plays and things where you're writing a character and the characters go off and do their things and i always used to say, and people my, friends of mine would laugh at me when i said this and i said and i'd get frustrated and say the characters won't do what i want them to do <laughs> That's cool. And they're like, really but you, cool. but they're your characters. You, I, yeah. Yeah, I did, but they're not. They don't belong. They're just, they just, if, if you made a good one, the same as a company. If you made a good one, it's going to go do its own thing. Yeah. And a couple of times in my life, I've had, I've worked for an agency and a couple of businesses that that got acquired by another business. And so it's a smaller business, usually with one founder or lead personality, and then they get bought out by somebody else. It was hysterical because it happened twice, three times really, but twice where they fight it. Every mm. the, the deal's done. They've made gobs of, of money on it. Yeah. They're great. They keep them there for in a, a president role or a, an advisory role or whatever it is they keep them in. And then the business gets becomes part of this larger business. And then it starts to change. Yeah. And they and they get frustrated. Oh, and because, painful. because when, and I always, I always laugh because I always just say, when, when you sell your business, this happened, my, my, my father-in-law happened, he was a veterinarian and he sold his, he sold his practice and they kept him there for a while, the transition. And he, and it's like, when you sell your business, it is not yours anymore. That's so it doesn't belong to you anymore. Yeah. You don't have that kind of control and control is a little bit of a phantom anyway, but it's, uh, and they really struggled with it. The point I one 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 time, and this may be a story for a whole nother episode, the guy who had been who had been CEO of the smaller company was kept in and whatever. And then he had he had been working behind the scenes because he wanted to take over the larger company and all this stuff. So a year, almost a year to the to the day, like his contract was up, right? The year to the day. And they met him at the door and escorted him out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> oh no that's With a rough. little bit of a rude awakening right talk about rude awakening yeah, yeah it was hard. rough and he's gone on to do very well for himself in other other companies so it's not i'm not and i won't name him so i'm not speaking out of school but it was it was i was i happened to be there that morning because i i used to take the i used to commute from new jersey into new york and so i was there earlier than most people and uh, so i saw this whole thing transpire on the, oh on the floor and i was like wow I'm just going to keep my head down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's major. That's a yeah. major it was, moment. It was wild. In his life. It, yeah. it, was, it was wild. And but but that's how it is. But but like you say, as as the CEO, it, 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 these things take on their own life. And mm -hmm. the larger they grow, I'm working with a client now that's that's basically doubled their size in the last two and a half years, and it's there. So they're wrestling with that. And yes. how it's, it, and it's a, it's a hundred year old family business. Right. Oh, and they're growing like crazy. And it's like, wow, that's gotta be rough to see where it's headed. And really, and you try and control and control may be the wrong word for it. I think it's just direct. Maybe mm -hmm. you, you just kind of, you, you, you pull the sheets on the, on the sailing vessel yeah. and try and guide it in the wind. Cause you can't really control it. You can only guide it through. And that, it's interesting. It's fun to watch because I'm outside of it too. So, <laughs> right, right. That's so interesting. And you talked about there were pieces that you were in the process of writing your book 
mm-hmm. that never made it past your desk that you yeah. discarded. What yeah. cri- how did what criteria did you use to decide this is what's going in, this is what's not, and how did you, when it was done and well you're ready to publish? It's funny you mentioned. I had one in there that I had written for my son or with my son in mind because I was carpooling with he and his friend to school. And I always like to listen to one type of music and they prefer something else. And uh, (laughs) so they would talk about this and that and the other thing. And I'd talk about God and I I had the radio on. I didn't have the, I didn't have any satellite or, or, or Bluetooth, anything. So they were like, Oh, skip this song. And I'm like, it can't, it's the radio. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, they have no concept of the radio. None. And I'm like, this is really funny. So I wrote this piece about music and getting exposed to music and how do you learn new stuff and get it was new bands for me. So it was always rock and roll bands, but it's whatever type of music you listen to, how do you get exposed to this stuff? And it was, it was a nice piece. It was all right. And it, it but I, I had it in the original manuscript and I ended up working with uh, one very close friend of mine, Rocket is his name. And he, he did the, I'm pointing, he did the design of the cover, which I absolutely love. Yeah. A couple of different versions. I love them all. And he and he helped me with the layout and the design of the book. And so he read everything and and he's a really sharp. He will say he's not a writer, but he's a, he's quite good. And he pointed that one out and he was like, no, oh, that's a, I don't know if that really fits. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not sure exactly. And I, I rewrote it because once the first time it was like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what it means. And then I went back and looked at it and I rewrote it and he said, no, this is bad. I like it. It's much better, but I still don't think it fits. I'm like, okay. So I went and grabbed another one and I, I slotted a couple in just to try to figure out which ones fit. And the book, it's, it, the book is, is divided into three sections where it's like thinking things, deciding things and writing things. And the ones that fit those categories stayed in the book. And the ones that didn't got put in a file somewhere, they may come back at another time. And I just figured I didn't want to make it too long. So it's, what is it now? About 148, 150 pages. And I I wanted it to be easily readable, easily digestible, but because I, I, I hope anyway, that, that people have to take a little time to think about what each one of them means. I didn't want it to be a reference guide. (laughs) I just wanted it to be a fairly quick, easy read. And, and so I, I landed on 30 pieces and the third there's one at the end that's there's one at the end that doesn't the one that's not like the others it's really like a a, a tips for good writing that i really liked and i thought i wanted to include in this thing and it made sense and as the last piece of this one and that's that's how that you just pick the best ones and and take your best guess at it sometimes it's the ones you like sometimes it's the ones the people you trust who read it like and you listen to those folks and and that's my friend who did the the cover also really helped me come up with the title because we were talking earlier i had a, a different title in my mind that i really liked but i wasn't sure it would work for other people and mm-hmm. it was originally just called the meditations on misbelief and hyphenated misbelief so mm-hmm. the idea is think about the things you believe and yeah. why because you're not always right <laughs> i'm not right. always right right and sometimes the things you believe change over time. So the idea was the same, but he really, he wanted something pithier and uh, that he could do a design with. And then it was funny, the, the d- cover design, he, he worked on it longer than I wanted him to. And I'm like, I'm waiting for this cover and I want to get, <laughs> I want to get it out there. Yeah. And he, he, we're on a Zoom call. He's because he was in, he was living in Brazil at the time. And so he, he gets on and he gets up in the camera like this. He says, are you are you ready? And I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. And I'm like, okay, okay, because I'm really excited about this. And he turned around. And he showed me the the cover, and the cover was a little different. It was it was on, originally it was on a the background instead of the green blue white background. It was on a it, imagine if you put a a piece of paper into a Xerox machine. And it printed out as that just black gray wash that you get from a blank page. And then he put, it was a different lemon, but he put the lemon on top of that in all black, glossy and whatever. And the, the, and layout of the title was a little bit different, but it was, but he showed it to me and he said, what do you think? And I, and I went like my chin dropped and my, 
my eyes went like dinner plates. And I was <laughs> like, because I had a whole bunch of other ideas in my head of what it would be. Yeah. And all of the, all of them, yellow fig, the color yellow figured prominently. Yeah. And this was nothing like what I was thinking about. And he showed it and I'm like, I love it. And, and then you know, he redid it a little bit and found a lemony like better and all this, but the concept was always the same. And I know your audience is a lot of writers. And yeah. if anybody's, if anybody's thinking about writing a book, the best advice I can give you after do the best writing you can and have a really great idea, which I understand just kind of gets gifted to you by the universe. Sometimes have, have somebody you really trust who can do the cover and, and give you some good input, good, hard things to listen to sometimes too, about what's good and bad about it and what needs to be changed and what works and doesn't work and all that. Cause yeah. as, as much as writing a book as a solo enterprise, producing a book and putting it out there to the world is absolutely a collaborative effort when it's done well. So, and I was fortunate to have one, one guy who could do both of those things. I had also a good friend who, who was a proofreader, who was invaluable to me, even though it's a weird format and grammar is not as important as some books. And Heather, my wife is, she's a voracious reader and she likes most of my stuff. And, and she was incredibly helpful as well. So, and my son, Aiden, Aiden's 14 now and he, and I would read stuff to him. And sometimes it was, sometimes he, but he always liked listening to it. Even mm -hmm. when he was with the earlier pieces, I read, I've read him stuff forever. And uh, I always read things out loud if to make sure, to make sure they sound right. Cause it's an auditory practice as much as it is a written one. So I would read things out to Aiden and see what, and he's like, oh, I really like that one. <laughs> and sometimes it's like, man, man it's, it's okay. What does that mean? I'm like, good. Keep asking that. This is um, so good. I could almost see this as almost like a daily app. I love how you, with that first title that you mentioned, the meditations, because I felt like all of this makes me think. Right. Mm -hmm. Even the cover when you were uh, like, okay, so why a lemon? Okay. Lemons are yellow, but there's no yellow into it, but there's right. certain, all of it makes you stop and think seeing the right. word yellow yep. spelled out in capital letters, but then oh, the my proofreader, the color. my proofreader hated the break in yellow, by the way, oh. that was on two lines, <laughs> couldn't stand it. Yeah. I mean, I'm I like, get it. I'm not changing it. <laughs> no, it's cool. All of it makes you think, right? And that's yeah. what we want. I think this is the anti-chat GPT. Like this, all of this is so refreshing because oh, it does make you think, right? That's a, that's a funny thing. That's a funny thing. Because I did take just totally out of curiosity. Yeah. I took a couple of these pieces that I wrote and put them into an AI tool. And said, basically, rewrite it, show them, to, you know, correct it, make it better, whatever. Yeah. And they came back and I'm like, oh my God, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't, it, it's a really specific style. It doesn't work. It, the, I, I don't think, I, it doesn't work if it's just pure prose. It has to be broken up this way. And we spent a lot of time making sure when when rocket was laying it out we did live layout sessions and just wow. kind of checked every every break every page break every line break and we caught things every every go around it was funny you catch things every step so if you catch something i don't want to hear about it exactly um, don't tell me <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you do and that's another lesson in in proofreading and editing is that there it's it's not a matter of making it perfect it's a matter of of minimizing the mistakes yeah, it doesn't work unless it's it's broken up this way. And the layout and the design line by line is part of the meaning, right? And I commented on somebody's something yesterday. They were talking about how they had a presentation and they were trying to make the argument that if if you stripped out of your pitch deck all the imagery and just had white background, black text, if it doesn't make sense, it's not going to work, mm. right? And I'm like, that kind of makes sense. And then a designer got in <laughs> and made a comment. And basically the, the picture is worth a thousand words perspective, yeah. which I bought, which I buy. But then I went in and commented and I said, and I get that and I agree with it. However, the designer 
still needs the story. The designer needs the words. What are you trying to communicate? Yes. So if you don't have a clear idea to communicate, you can't put the right picture with it. Yeah. (laughs) I've had a a wonderfully love-hate relationship with a lot of designers over the years because they have very specific ideas about things. And I don't always agree. And I'm not always in charge either. I had a lot of creative directors I've worked with were designers first. I prefer working with a creative director who, if they're not a writer first, they're definitely a writer as well. Because I think writing is not just writing. Writing is storytelling. Writing is designing. Writing is thinking. Writing is a lot of these things. And so for every one page of finished product I have, I have a hundred pages of notes filling a drawer or a trash can or something. (laughs) And because you got to work through it all. And when design's the same way as you you work through a lot of iterations of of what you're doing to try and communicate an idea. And whether you're doing that with a picture or or letters. I love that. I love even when you were talking about that word misbelief in the first (laughs) in the first title that you were thinking about it and in the hyphen. Right. We have to know when you were talking about writers are all of these things and we, all of these activities are associated, not just mm-hmm. thinking of words and typing them on a, on a key- keyboard, mm-hmm. but we're translators, right? Like we, oh, yeah. we are tran- we're distilling information and we're thinking about who we want to reach and what they speak, what they're going to uh, receive. And right. out of all the, the language that we can use, what's the precise word that we need to use for this, this situation and we need to know those things so that we can give it to the designer so that they can visually figure out how to communicate. I feel like if one thing is wrong, if we're using the wrong word, that takes everything off off the track. I think you could yeah, no, come I, up with a different result. I agree. It's and it's different. And it depends. And and there's an interpretive component to it all, yeah. too. It's like whoever reads it reads it in a different way. I forget I, I want to say it was a Mel Brooks movie or a Mel Brooks sketch or something where he t- they were doing the to be or not to be speech from Hamlet. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the actor decided he was going to do it in a different way. And so instead of to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind, blah, blah, blah. And he said, to be or not, to be that is. The question is whether it is nobler in the mind. And he and he, he broke it all. And it's, wow. it was, it's hysterical. Because yeah. It's a comedy. But in the way he presented it and acted it out, it was just a, it was a riot because it's like, wow, that's just so wrong. But then if you, <laughs> you listen to it a little closer, you're like, well, wait a second. Let me think about that for, for just a minute. <laughs> and yeah, maybe there's something there because the way people read sentences that you write they might read them differently than you intended them right. to be read. And so that's so, and, and you can't control any of that, but it's, you can think about it a little bit. Yeah. You can do your best try, to anticipate. Yeah. Try yeah. and get, and that's, and that's what this does because it's all very line period, line period, dot, 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 dash, whatever I use, I forget in all these places is designed. Like when you write a play or when you read a play, you will see different types of, punctuation to notate what the actor should do. And then you have things in parentheses for stage directions. So if you, you, a lot of modern plays don't have that much in it. They, they have, it's mainly just text and you, you read it like it's a normal uh, punctuation. But if you read like a Samuel Beckett play, it has a ton of little ellipses to indicate pauses and then mm-hmm. have stage directions that say long pause and things like this because he was he was very very specific about what he wanted how he wanted his play to be uh presented and they're harder to read <laughs> it's advanced it's advanced theater reading but if you can get into the zone of it it's you you, you get exactly what he means and you're not going to misunderstand it so i don't know it's just there's different ways around all this stuff and and the biggest thing the best advice I ever, best writing advice I ever got was I was starting my job. I was actually interviewing for my job at the newspaper, my first newspaper. So I went to a, a town meeting and I came back to the newsroom and the, the main reporter for the town 
was at the same meeting and she came back and she was writing her stuff. And she said, so you're trying out for the paper, right? I said, yeah. And I said, what are you, you going to do? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> With all this information, I have pages and pages. Yeah, of and, and she said, do you want to, you want to tip? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> sure. And she said, and we're so we're, and they were, this was the days we were there, there were console machines. They weren't even like PCs. They were wow. like these big console machines that were, that were, that would shoot straight to the typesetter. And she said, pick one, pick one, one topic that you thought was important. And I'm like, okay, well, that, that simplifies it right there. Because never having done it before, I thought, well, I write one article that covers everything that happened in the meeting. Mm-hmm. And no, 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 no. Each one of these things is a separate story that talks about, one talks about sewage and drainage. One talks about science. One talks about parking, whatever it is they're talking about. So pick out the one you think is important. And don't worry about it because they're all important. So just pick one. Like, okay. And then sit down and try to explain it as if you're talking to your grandmother. And I said, and I, you know, and she said, no, <laughs> your grandmother knows nothing about any of this, right? And I said, no, not in a million years. So explain it like you're explaining to your grandmother. And I'm like, okay. I sat down and I wrote it and I sent it in and they ran it and I got the job and I worked in the newspaper for a few years and it was great. But the lesson was not be simple and explain it to somebody who doesn't understand it, although that's important. It's be really clear on who you're talking to. Be really clear on who, because as much as uh, your client wants to be the audience, they want to be the person you're talking to. You need to sell them. That's not who matters. Who matters is the person who's receiving it. And if you're not clear on that, you're going to have a real uphill battle. But if you can, even to the point where, and I've done this with some, some clients who, who aren't getting it, where I'll write a little thing at the top that says the audience is, or the, the target is, and describe who that person is and basically describe their customer. And, and then, and then you have the stuff you wrote. And then that way there's some context. There's a setup. It's like a a good joke has a setup and a punchline, right? And it's like, it's like that. And and that they're more able to picture the stuff you created in the place they thought was supposed to be talking to themselves. That's that's the biggest danger is you, see, you keep you start talking to yourself all the time, and that's 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 bad, I think. And I'm sure you, <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with that that very much. That yeah, conundrum. I get into it with myself. <laughs> start fighting with myself, <laughs> debating. Yeah, it can it can get it can get ugly quickly. <laughs> right, right. I love oh, it. You, you put so much intention in this and everything and every part of everything that you've written. We've talked about the cover. We've talked about the title so much. What, what do you want this impact to be on the readers of this book? What do you want them to do after reading it? How do you want their life to change after they take in Why Yellow Matters? <laughs> I want a million people to carry it around with them every day. <laughs> It's funny. I have I have a bunch of books. I'm as you might expect. I'm a book guy. Yeah. And there are some novels I read every year. I'll go back and read Gatsby every year. There are some things I'll look at. There, there's. I'm such a geek. Oh my god. I'm admitting this. I read the Declaration of Independence every Fourth of July. Oh, I love that. Partly because I think it's important to remember what the holiday is about. Mm-hmm. And partly it's just really good writing. There's there's some there's some crazy stuff down there in the he did this, he did that <laughs> section, but there's some really good writing at the beginning and the end. And so and I have sitting on my desk, as I'm sure you have somewhere nearby, I have I have an AP style guide. I have a strunk and white little how to write well guide these sort of things that I have around that I pick up when I, when I need to remember something. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, what's it? Wait, lay or lie? What, which one is that? And oh, I that one always it gets me. It up. <laughs> I couldn't tell you right now. It's, 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 <laughs> that's why I have the book. <laughs> right. oh, but I feel like I, if I could declare 
what I what I would like this to be, and I know I can't. But it would be nice for it to be the, the thing that that sits around, sits on somebody's shelf after they've read it, maybe a couple of times. I don't know. And there's one or two that really resonate with them or really confuse them, maybe. And they keep going back to it every so often to say, oh, oh yeah, that, yeah. And that helps me do what I'm working on better. For me, that would be it. It's like, it's, it's not a reference guide, but a, an inspiration guide, I guess, or a, maybe a clarif- a reminder, really. Again, that, that idea that take the time to get it right, take the time to ask why. If, 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 that, if this thing can remind them to do that more often, I think that's a victory right there. Very cool. I love it. Well, I will definitely be revisiting it and continuing to think about it and take Thank breaks because I have to absorb and really meditate. It's great stuff. What's what's next for you? I know you've written plays, you've had books, you've got <laughs> ideas for days. Is another well, book on the way? Yeah. Well, the idea was, to, uh, this was a heavy lift. It's funny. It's yeah. not a long book, but it's a project to get it out there. That said, I have learned how to do the indie publishing thing. And I had a couple of friends, friends of mine from kindergarten. Wow. Both have written books. Very cool. Uh, in different fields. One is a sales guy. My friend Brett Kierstead wrote a book called We're All Sales People. And uh, <laughs> And my friend Peggy DeLong, Dr. Peggy DeLong, she's a psychologist, wrote a couple of books, but she wrote a fantastic memoir. And then she wrote one, The Gratitude Guide, because that's her area of practice now. And and they went through a one of these companies that does uh, beyond vanity publishing and and into the indie publishing world. And it's like, let me control it myself kind of a thing. And so I, I, I talked to them a little bit about it and, and, and did my own research into it and realized with my background in publishing and, and newspapers and printing and all that kind of stuff, I could, I could do most of this stuff myself. And I had, I had some good resources as far as proofreader, a couple of good editors and a designer. Cover, de- cover design is really, really important. So anybody do- thinking about doing one, it, it, it separates you from the, the books that Indie publishing with a lowercase i and indie independent publishing with a capital I. That's wow. the difference. And the cover makes all the difference. And so I did it myself. So I worked through that, all that myself, which gave me a lot of extra work and a lot of extra headache. But it's it's a lot of, I have gratitude for it because I did it. And so I had always thought of this as volume one. I've called it volume one. It's a little dangerous calling it volume one because you got to come <laughs> up with volume two. But I have a list of other topics and thoughts, and it'll 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 be three different sections. So, like this one is thinking things, deciding things, and writing things. The next one will be three different themes. Vague. I have a vague idea that there are three volumes, and mm. and maybe when I have all three, I'll put it out as a hardcover. I don't know. But I have a series of novels that I have in mind that if I can manage to put time aside to work on, I'm going to work on. And then Nimblesmith is is going strong and creating brand stories and content for people. I ghostwrite as well. I spend a lot of time writing for other people. And that's another thing. People should use ghostwriters. <laughs> <laughs> Busy people should use ghostwriters because they can help you find your voice. They can help you clarify your message. They can help you really understand your audience because a lot of times, again, a lot of times you start talking to yourself and mm-hmm. it doesn't mean as much. So I have all that work that I had hoped the book would try- drive some more work. It would sell some copies, which it's which it's doing. And it's, I'm grateful for that. Mm-hmm. People seem to be, be happy with it. I get quoted back to myself from time to time, which is very strange. <laughs> It's a very strange thing, but it's fun. And then I have other stuff I want to do. Creative people always have a million things they want to do and have to figure out which ones are the most important to them. So that's me. That's where I am. No plays on the on the horizon. I did that a long time ago. <laughs> I'm vaguely considering what it might look like if I were to start helping people independently publish their own books. Because it seems to me... There's, I think there's a there's a space between some of these agencies, businesses that help you write your book through to publishing, and people who don't really need the help writing it. 
there's a lot of us out there who have a lot of, <laughs> have a lot to say and they really just need the help taking it from manuscript to available in Amazon and Barnes and Noble and wherever else Apple books wherever you're going to make it available so there I think there's a gap there that I feel like maybe I could help some people with and so that that's something I might expand into it's still kind of a vague idea but I love that. I think lots of people would be interested in in that needing that handholding. I think your experience too in marketing and communications and storytelling and journalism, I think yeah. makes you especially like qualified, I think, yeah. to offer a new perspective on that. Cuz so much of what I hear with writing a book is the mark is like once you get it birthed, it's like right. you have to market it. You have to tell you gotta people market about it. it. You got to push it. You got to do ads, even if you don't want to. You gotta, right. You got to get on podcasts. <laughs> you know, uh, whatever, you, whatever you can do to get the, you got to get the word out. Is what it yeah. is. And like I, I did this book. I'm very proud of it. Uh, I'm very happy with the way it came out. I mean, I had a friend who was, who was a design. He was a partner in the Michael Graves Design Group, and he was he was holding and he was holding the paper, and he's like, "Did you get to pick the paper and stuff?" And I was like, "Because I love the way it feels." Wow. And I'm like, "Well, it's funny because because when you're doing this, you you don't have as much leeway on those types of things that that you might like to have." But again, having a little bit of background in that's, that's the guy from the newspaper business is, is printing. And I'd go hang out in the printer after, after deadline and watch the papers come off. And so I, I intentionally chose a, a paper that was a matte finish, not a glossy finish, that kind of stuff. And he's like, yeah, no, I really, it just feels good. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm glad that's another thing. That's, I like that. Yeah. Um, I like the matte because you can take notes because I've, underline things and stuff so maybe it's a workbook maybe it's a journal maybe it's like a daily app i I, I would love to hear you record it too i i have i have a vague idea of doing that too and i just i haven't quite figured out how to execute on it but i'll i'll get there my friend brett and his book he did he did an audiobook version of his book and it was it came out wonderfully so i'm gonna lean on him a little bit i love it lyle where can people get a copy how can people continue to follow you on well, all the places on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I am, well, nimblesmith.com is the business. Mm-hmm. Whyyellowmatters.com is, is a central book page, but you can get it at Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. If you do and you like it, write a review, please. That's really <laughs> helpful. I'm on, I'm personally on Facebook. I'm business-wise on LinkedIn and I'm, I'm embracing Instagram now just under my name, Lyle Smith. And I did, I have, I have a threads. I'm experimenting. I had, I had Twitter and didn't like the idea of X. So I don't really do that anymore. I think Instagram is a friendlier place. It's probably the videos and photos that make it. So I don't do TikTok. I don't know. Maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's an age thing, generation. Yeah. But I post a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. I post a lot. That's on, and that's uh, NimbleSmith. So LinkedIn.com slash NimbleSmith. And I post a lot on, or I'm trying, I'm starting to post a lot on Instagram. So thank uh, but, you so much. Thank you. This, this was is great. Fun. I thank really you, appreciate Lyle. it. <laughs> and I'll include all the links to the book page and the website for the company and all the social media platforms in the show notes. It's funny. This is another indie publishing thing. If you order directly from me, it may take a little longer to get because I have, I have to order books sometimes and and all that. But you get a you get a fun little you get a a, a fun little gifty from me. Like a little I button. have mine. <laughs> Pretty close to the camera. Uh, yeah. I make slightly more money if you order directly from me, but the if you write a review, get it through Amazon, and the Amazon reviews are more valuable than the difference in price. So mm. or Barnes and Noble or if you're a Goodreads person, that's I'm learning about Goodreads. I never really did it, but it's it seems to be a good thing for driving interest if you get some reviews out there. So it's a whole it's a whole new. I mean, that part of it is a whole new thing for me. So it's it's yeah. kind of hard to to investigate. Thank you, Lyle. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for creating this. You've given us lots to think about. Thanks, Ashley. I love what you're doing. I appreciate you having me on, even though you're focused on the female writers out there. I I hope some of this is helpful to your folks.